Welcome to Kelly Minds for Manners, a podcast about real estate and entrepreneurship with a twist. Here's your host, Kelly Robinson. Welcome to another episode of Kelly Minds for Manners. Today, I am interviewing Rory Gallaud, who's SVP of Growth and Communications at Compass, where he has been since 2014 in many different roles. Rory is not only a fearless leader who you will learn so much from, and he's so introspective, but he's also a kick-ass guitar player. And perhaps at the end, he'll share a little bit of his guitar playing with you. We also have six questions in my Fearless Five instead of five. Will Rory answer all of them? You might have to wait till the end. Follow Rory on Instagram at Mighty Roar. Welcome, Rory Glowed to Kelly Minds Her Manners. I am so excited today. I have been waiting for this moment for so long. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Yeah, I've known you for so long now. Yeah. Time flies. And I just have so much respect for you. So I'm really yeah. grateful that you took the time out of your very busy schedule to come and speak with of me course. and us. Thank you. Likewise. I mean, this is this is awesome what you've put together, the following you've built around this. So I'm just fortunate I get to be a guest on here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so I want to start with your story. I want the audience to hear your story. So let's go back to childhood. Okay. I want to know what your childhood was like growing up in Cold Spring Harbor, New York, mm -hmm. on Long Island. Yeah. A beautiful place, by the way. Yes. And what family like was life and how it shaped you and helped you become who you are today. Yeah. So I would say my family and family life has had a massive influence on me. It, it has on everyone, but I've had quite the dynamic is the adjective I'll use <laughs> childhood. So I grew up on Long Island, Cold Spring Harbor. Very proud to be from Long Island, from Cold Spring Harbor. My family still you know, lives there, so I still spend a lot of time there. And it was me, my brother, my sister, my mom and dad. My parent, my mom and dad are both originally from the greater New York area. So my mom's okay. from Queens, my dad's from Yonkers. So I'm a New Yorker through and through. And so we lived on Long Island. My mom and dad got divorced when I was in sixth grade. And my mom, and my best friend since kindergarten's dad got married. Oh, wow. So my best friend since kindergarten, Matt, became my stepbrother <laughs> and his younger brother, Chris. And so it was Matt and Chris and me, my brother, Al, and my sister, Chloe. So the five of us became a Brady Bunch oh, cool. when I was in sixth grade. Okay. So, you know, obviously divorce is a traumatic event for, for, for kids and families. Of but course. I actually look back on that experience as, as this almost amazing second version of childhood in a way because I had the experience of just me, my brother, my sister, and my parents being married. And then I was so fortunate to have my stepdad come into my life, who today I look at as a truly a second father. You know, I, I always say I have two dads. Yeah. And my stepbrothers who I call them stepbrothers, but we think of each other as brothers. When we think about our family, you know, we say we have there's five kids. So it really is truly a Brady bunch. You know, I consider myself insanely lucky because growing up I had the influence of not just siblings, but my dad, my mom, my stepdad, my grandparents lived really close to where I was as well. So I was incredibly close to my grandfather, who was a legend in every sense of the word you could imagine. <laughs> and so, you know, a lot of that is really what shaped me. And, and I would say Long Island and Cold Spring Harbor shaped me, the environment in particular. It's, you know, it's historically a whaling town, so it's on the water. It's very much focused on the beach and being outside. And so growing up, I was constantly down by the beach, on boats, outdoors. That was something that was very important to me. I remember even as a kid, my dad loved water skiing. And it was me, my brother, and my sister, and we were on the boat with him. I think I was 10. There was, I, there, I was no older than 10. And he wanted to go water skiing because he was tired of just driving the boat for us. Uh -huh. And so he's like, you're the oldest, you drive. And I'm like, you know, I don't think this is a good idea. <laughs> he's like, just, 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 you got it. And so he's in the water, slalom skiing, and I'm driving the boat full throttle with my brother and sister spotting. I think if I were 10, my brother was eight, my sister was five. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so that's sort of, so it was a very fun and exciting way to grow up. And, you know, I then went off to college in Virginia at the University of Richmond. And then as soon as I graduated college, I moved to New York City. 
And that was almost preordained for me because both my dad and mom, when they graduated college, they moved to New York City. Okay. And getting an apartment in Manhattan and living on your own was a rite of passage. And it was totally. one that I was looking forward to for years. It's, it's actually why I give so much credit to people who aren't from New York who do that, who move to New York City without knowing anyone or anything and just doing it. For me, I felt like I kind of had it easy because I knew this is what I was going to do. And, you know, since then I've, I've lived here in Manhattan and now I live in New York with my wife and my beautiful almost three-year-old daughter. So, Archer. I love that name, Archer. by the way. Yeah. So my father-in-law's name is Archie. Okay. So it's a derivative of that. And, okay. you know, it was a, a, a beautiful homage to him, but also a really cool name yeah. and one that, you know, sort of androgynous, which I think is kind of cool when yeah. you're not really sure. And so that name was one when, you know, when it just clicks and you hear it, you're like, that's it. Yeah. And then I think back to some of the other ideas I, that we had around names and I'm like, very happy it didn't go that direction. <laughs> and I always joke around that if I have other children, then I have to find a way for them for them to feel special in the eyes of my in-laws because Aww. obviously Archer is, you know, is, is the queen. So. Aww. I love that name. I think it's an awesome name and it's so different. And, you know, I, you just hear the same names over and over and over and over and over again now. It's just like. Yeah. Well, I'm Rory. My wife is Drew. So we have different. Have different names yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. So we kind of wanted something a little a little different. Yeah. My so. name is Kelly Robinson. There are like 5,000 <laughs> of me. Before technology, banks used to get me mixed up with people and I would have like phantom withdrawals on my account. It was crazy. I'm like, thanks, mom and dad. They almost named me Siobhan, which would have been different, but nobody would have been able to spell, spell it. it. That's the thing. The Gaelic with spelling. Exactly. That's the thing. I think when I remember hearing that name and then seeing how it was spelled and thinking they were two totally different names. Yeah. So. Siobhan. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like it's I would have been butchered my entire yeah. life. <laughs> anyway, I love the names. You guys all have great names. But but let's talk about when you were 11 and you started playing the guitar because you are a badass guitar player. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so growing up my dad loved rock and roll music still does and when he was a kid rock and roll and going to concerts was was the thing so he used to go to concerts in new york city at a place called the fillmore east which was down on i believe 14th between second and third and it was basically the size of a movie theater it was a 1800 person auditorium and he used to go to concerts in 1969 1970 1971 and this is really before great bands and artists started playing arenas. So you got to see these incredible artists in these tiny little venues, right? Think about today, we would never get to see the great artists that we love play these small venues today. And right. so, you know, he saw Jimi Hendrix, New Year's Eve, 1969, Allman Brothers, Seven Times, The Who, Janis Joplin, all these amazing artists. So as a kid, every time we were driving in his truck, or at home, or doing some sort of activity or chore. He'd always put us to work, so we was doing yard work. Uh -huh. Classic rock would be playing. So I just had that kind of reverberating around me, and I started to get really excited for it. And then I bought Led Zeppelin One, and I listened to that album. I was in fifth grade, and I remember you know putting headphones on, listening to it, and just being blown away by the sounds that I was hearing. Like yeah. the things that Jimmy Page and Robert Plant did on that album were just, I'd never heard sounds like that. Mm -hmm. It just really inspired me to want to actually be able to create those sounds. And so I wanted to start playing guitar. My dad was so excited, bought me a guitar and got me guitar lessons. And I took lessons once a week for seven years. And that laid this foundation for me to where then after that, I went off to college and then just kept going. And then I knew enough where I could start teaching myself and now I play just about every other day and I I love it. It's the thing that's so rewarding about it is it's perpetual. So you never finish it. You never get to a place where you're like, okay, I'm good. That's I've learned everything, right? You're yeah. it's and I really love perpetual pursuits because there's always something where you can get better, right? It's like my favorite sport is golf because uh -huh. you can always do more. You always get better. There's always a different course to play. And so it's with guitar, I feel it's like that. And also it's something you can share. I love playing 
live in front of people because you get to share that experience with people. So it's something I, I just I enjoy so much. And hopefully my neighbors in my apartment enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're really good. So I'm sure they will. And we're going to share a clip of you jamming it out later for <laughs> okay. the audience. Okay. Rory had way too much today to drag his guitar around. So I know we'll... you had asked, but I, yeah, it was like, if we're going to do it, let's do it right. Yeah. You know? I was like, we got to get a big app and let, you know, let's set it up. So. Yeah. So, so was, was like, Led Zeppelin, the reason you chose guitar versus like piano. Your dad played piano. Yeah, my dad played piano. Yeah, I would say I would say two things. One, yeah, listening to Led Zeppelin, I was just so enamored with Jimmy Page. This the the what he was doing with the guitar to me just sort of blew me away. And there was this almost like god like mythical like mm. sense of these guitar players, right? When you think about Jimi Hendrix, Eddie Van Halen, you know, my favorite if I had to pick three which is very, very hard. But if I had to pick three for me, it's Slash, mm -hmm. Steve Ray Vaughan, mm -hmm. and Prince. And oh, yeah. all three of them had this, you know, mythical godlike aura. And I think there's just something about guitar that, that creates that. And so I just, I wanted to be like them. And so I was like, well, they're playing guitar. So I guess I'll play guitar. Yeah. And yeah, so now I'm, you know, full on obsessed and... My, I played a, a gig two nights ago down at the Cutting Room in New York City with That's a. Awesome. It was a Doors cover band, so it was an event. It was a Compass event, and I got got on stage to a song with them. So I, I love it. It's awesome, and you're really good at it. You know who else I love? Derek Trucks. Oh. I went and saw him play in the middle of the desert in Moab, Utah. That's an experience. And let me tell you, there's plenty of vegetarian food there for me. <laughs> <laughs> That I've, night at the food truck. I, I was about to say, I don't know how many vegetarians are at that show, but he's, a lot. he's amazing. I mean, he's the cool amazing. thing is he plays with his wife, you know, the Ted Eshi Trucks band. And yeah. I mean, when your lineage and your roots trace back to the Allman Brothers, it's it's crazy because if Dwayne Allman, who's the godfather of slide guitar, which Derek Trucks is today, the best slide guitar player in the world, if he only knew that someone who is connected to a band member of his then would take his mantle as being this amazing slide guitar player. I bet he'd be pretty impressed with it. But Derek Trucks, I mean, he was a childhood phenom. Yeah, there are yeah. clips on YouTube of him when he's 12 years old on stage playing in front of thousands of people. And you look up and there's this kid in a baseball hat. It's amazing. And so, yeah, he's awesome. It's amazing. So your, your comment about things that are perpetual, it's interesting just given your journey in business, right? So... You were already – you already had a good business mind from maybe before college, but you won the business plan competition at the University of Richmond in 2008. Yeah. Oh, you really did your homework. The, <laughs> that No, I mean, that's really interesting and it makes sense – that you would have done that and won. It was the business plan competition, right? For, yeah. For, yeah, for the Robin School of Business. For the Robin School of Business. Yeah. That's amazing. So was that part of a project that you had to do or is this something you just wanted to do? It's something I just wanted to do. So it's funny. Business for me is something that I I grew up around. My My father was an entrepreneur. My stepfather worked in finance. And I was always just so curious about what they did. I feel like when you're a kid – your parents go to work and you don't really know what that means or all you know is that they come home from work and you're excited to see them. And then what happens between them leaving in the morning and coming home is sort of just like, okay, my parents go to work. Right. What do they do? I don't know. Yeah. Right. But I was always really curious about it. And I just had an entrepreneurial mindset as a kid. I was the kid who, when we would have a fundraiser at school and you'd have to go door to door and sell wrapping paper or cookies, I would come up with a plan on how to get to every house first <laughs> before anyone else could sell the most to get the prize. I remember in fourth grade, we did this and the prize was a portable TV. Oh, my now, gosh. Now, I was in fourth grade. It was probably 1993 or something. So the portable TV was black and white with a little antenna. It, it was not really even a portable TV. It was uh -huh. terrible. But I, t I was so excited about that prize that I basically crisscrossed the entire neighborhood and then I created – 
I didn't know at the time, an affiliate program <laughs> where I would tell people if they purchased something, they got a friend to purchase something, I'd give them something for free. So it was like multi-level marketing. Exactly. <laughs> Even though I had no mechanism to give them anything for free. And I remember, and then I got my, my grandfather one night, I, he was over, he had had a couple of glasses of wine mm -hmm. and I, I, I knew he was vulnerable at that moment and I got him to buy like one of everything. Oh my gosh. Um, and I, you know, I, pl I would plan parties. I would plan events. I would always, I wanted to be sort of in the mix of what I didn't know at the time was business, yeah. was thinking about how to bring people together or bring value to people to do things that they wanted and then compensated for it. And so when I got to college, my freshman year roommate and, and best friend, Doug Banker, he was the same way. And so we became best friends, but we both shared this love for entrepreneurship and this love for music. And so throughout college, we had a music production company and we were in Virginia for school, but we were running, it was based in New York. So it was remote work before oh <laughs> before remote gosh. work existed. And we had a, a recording studio in Midtown Manhattan that we were responsible for the lease. And we would wow. bring artists in to record there. We had producers that made music that we would sell that worked for us. We had an artist that was signed to us. And we were both wow. interning. Yeah, we our summer internships were at record companies. So I was interning at Atlantic Records. He was oh, interning cool. at Sony. Very cool. And so we were trying to parlay that into it. And then the business plan was sort of something, a platform built around that. And so that was, for me, it never felt like work. It That always felt as, wow, this is where I get energy. This is where I get excitement. And so, you know, that that's how it came together. And you have a love for music. And I'm sure the judges were, it, I mean, it's such an interesting topic to write a business plan about, right? I, I'm sure the judges I were just think, interested too. I think it was kind of cheating a little bit because we basically took our existing business and we just took a business plan to take our existing business to the next level. So where I think everyone else entered the competition with a theoretical idea, <laughs> we we showed up and said, this is what we're doing. We want to take it to the next level. And we had a full plan. We had P&L projections. Oh God, God. God knows what, what they actually had in it. But it was very built out and detailed. And I think the judges were pretty blown away. And look, at the end of the day, a lot of this is how you communicate it, how you sell it. Yeah. How, and we were so passionate about it that it was pretty easy, I think, to get people excited for it. So we we won the contest. We won some money. I think we won like a couple thousand dollars. That's amazing. Yeah. So it was, it was it was pretty cool. That is cool. And I don't think you were cheating. I mean, <laughs> who else in the competition went out and built a business? So you put together a business plan that you kind of already had, but like most people that age don't know how to put together a business plan for a company yeah. they already have. I don't even think I knew what P&L was like, <laughs> until like five years ago. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm, you unfortunately, know. Like, you know, I would have conversations, you know, with my dad or stepdad around dinner, or catching up or hanging out when I was a teenager. And these were the things I would ask them about. Yeah. Talk to me about your job and what you do and what does this mean? And and so for me, it was just always, I was very naturally curious about it. That's awesome. Well, shows in what you're doing now. So after Richmond, you went to Yext. Yep. What was Yext like? What did you do at Yext? All right. So when I graduated college, it was June of 2008. Okay. Which was the worst time ever to graduate college. Maybe yeah. with the exception of June 2020. <laughs> my brother graduated then too. So le leading up to that, it was funny. My parents at the time had a different vision for where I was going to go. I think they appreciated the entrepreneurial things I was doing. They were excited and they saw how hard I was working at the music business. But I think they wanted to see me go in a different direction. My mother was uh, passionately nudging me, we'll say, towards working in finance. Okay. And at the time, actually, I thought I would just want to do the opposite of what she was saying naturally. <laughs> and so I said, no, we're going to do this music thing. We're going to do this. I'm going to, when I graduate, I'm not going to have a job. I'm just going to take the company we built and really go all in, which I totally understand as a parent of a 22 year old, why that sounds a little crazy. <laughs> and so that was the plan. And then 2008 happens. And, you know, all the, the record labels that were basically our clients, Everything dried up and we were able, fortunately, to unwind the studio and sort of unwind the business. And we started a actually an online digital platform to bring content together for a lot of the people that we were working with. And my business partner, Doug, went on and did that and made that really successful. And cool. for me, I was looking for what do I want to do? And I was enamored with startups. I, I, this, this idea of entrepreneurship keeps coming back to this theme of taking something small and building it. 
And I almost looked at going to work for a big company at that point as so uninteresting to me. Mm -hmm. Even though looking back, it actually is a great experience, I think, when you do first graduate to go work if you can, if you're fortunate enough to get a job at a really well-run big organization because you just learn things in that setting that prepare you. And so I wanted to go work for a startup. Facebook at the time, it was 2008, Facebook was really starting to emerge as, as this really impressive, fast-growing company before the movie. But again, I was exposed to it via college. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, what's, what's going to be the Facebook of New York? And so I got in touch with someone who connected me to a recruiter at Yext. This was before they even were named Yext. They were okay. called Alpha 411. Okay. And I went for the interview and I met with Brian Distelberger, who was one of the founders and the president of the company, who's a, a, a still a good friend to this day. And I remember walking into the office and it was a classic startup environment, which I had never seen. I just imagined what it'd be like, you know, loft-like space. Mm -hmm. People sitting on top of each other, <laughs> so loud. Everyone's running around, so much chaos and energy and excitement. And I remember sitting with him and he sort of sketched out, here's the business plan, here's what we're trying to do. And if we're successful, here's what we'll achieve. And between you know what he described and his vision and the energy that I felt walking in there, I was sold. Yeah. And and it was also it was a startup. So it was informal. It was fun. There was music playing. It was like it felt like college. Yeah. And so I was like, all right, I'm in. And and I worked there for a couple of years. And you know, today it's pretty remarkable that the X is a publicly traded company and awesome. one of the top companies in in the online information space. And so I was really lucky to get to be there for those first couple of years as the business really scaled and grew and I watched them raise capital and really expand and grow. And so it was a fantastic experience. That's super And that, cool. that lit the fire in me for this is the space I want to be in. Yeah. Emerging, growing companies and, and that startup space. I was At that point, I was hooked. Yeah. So. And then you went to Fancy. Well, actually, so in between. Oh. So I, I, leave, I leave Yext and I actually do the opposite. Okay. I go work at Bloomberg. Oh, so, I thought that yeah, yeah. Fancy so, was so, before Blue. Okay, so Fancy was after Bloomberg. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. So, so I go to Bloomberg. I work there for a few years. That's where I sort of check the box on. I need, I need some corporate experience. You made mom happy. <laughs> yes, made mom very happy. <laughs> I have a a good friend and mentor who was head of human resources at Bloomberg, who I was having a conversation with. What what I want to do? Do I want to start my own company? Do I want to go to business school? Do I, I wasn't really sure. And there was a great opportunity to go there. It's an amazing company. They they really value training, education, and mm. teaching their people. So there are a lot of ex Bloomberg people have gone on to do these pretty incredible things. Mm. They have a pretty incredible training program. I actually work now at Compass with a number of former Bloomberg people oh, who cool. are yeah really talented, smart people. And so I worked there for a couple of years, but. Again, it was hard for me to get excited about being at a 13,000 person organization yeah. if I wasn't in charge. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember it's a very transparent company. So you know, the executives you know, sit on the same floor as everyone. And at, while this was going on, Mike Bloomberg was mayor of New York City, so he wasn't involved in the day to day. Right. But I remember you know, every time I would see the executives meeting in a room, everything's glass so you can see everything. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, I want to be in that room. Yeah. And so... After a couple of years, I, I felt like this really isn't the context in which I think I can be my best self. Mm. And and I, I needed to find my way back to that startup entrepreneurial place. And so I went to work at Fancy, which was an e-com startup. Okay. Company had, you know, was just raised $60 million from American Express and a number of, you know, really well regarded investors. And you know, this was the time when Fab.com and a lot of these e-com businesses really started to take off. And so I was there and that, that experience was awesome because that one I got to really step in at a leadership level and really help run and shape the business. And I was doing well there. The business was doing really well. Everything was going to plan. And then I found out about Urban Compass, Four Year Compass, and met Rob Lehman and Robert Refkin. And, you know, every everything changed then. <laughs> and and who pursued you harder? So it's really interesting. I my my wife worked with someone who's so her friend Marielle, her husband Jamie worked at Goldman with Robert. Okay. And Jamie and Marielle are really good friends of of my wife and I's. Okay. And 
uh, it was about seven months before I actually connected with Robert and the team at Urban Compass. Oh, wow. They said to me, hey, you should meet our friend Robert. He just started this company called Urban Compass. You guys would really hit it off. He's an entrepreneur. You should get together with him. Now, you know when people make these introductions, you're sort of like, yeah, sure, it sounds great. Yeah. But then you don't really pursue it because life gets in the way. Right. And, and you're thinking more transactional. Is this really going to help me in the short term? You know, it's, I'll save their time, my time. So we actually got put on an email thread. And I remember he wrote back to me, hey, we're just about to launch. Let's connect in a couple of weeks. And I never followed up. And it kind of just... Kind of like, yeah, it's really not a lot of people know that it taught me like always follow up. Yeah, always follow up. Because <laughs> <Always follow> <laughs> if I didn't and I went back years later and didn't pursue the opportunity and saw what the company was doing, I would have really kicked myself for that. Yeah. And then I was connected to someone who connected me to someone that kind of got me back to the company. And then I saw that they had brought on Leonard. So when Leonard Steinberg joined Urban Compass at the time, there were articles everywhere about it, and not just in real estate publications, Business Insider and all these. It was a really big deal. Yeah. And so I started to sort of take notice of it because my brother is a commercial real estate broker. So I kind of – he was seeing what was going on. I was seeing what was going on. And then I put the two and two together of like, oh, I was connected with this person. And I remember going in for that first interview – and so Rob Lehman and I had a real interview. Mm -hmm. And then Robert came in. And I think our conversation was six minutes. And he asked me two questions. That's all I remember because he was talking about these things. I was so excited and what he was talking about. And then he said, asked me two things. He said, one, how much time do you spend planning versus execution? What he was trying to get to is are you someone who can execute and move fast yeah. and be creative or are you someone who gets kind of paralyzed by planning and needing to make everything sort of fit? And I yeah. said – but coming from a startup environment, I'm in 90% execution and 10% planning because that, that's really the environment you, you're in in, the, in that context. Yeah. And he said, OK. And he didn't really react. So I was I didn't know if that's the answer he wanted right. to hear. <laughs> and then the next thing he said is, do you want to change the world? And I was, well, of course. Yeah. <laughs> anyone who does it, anyone who says no, probably a big red flag. So I was like, yeah, sure. I'll change the world. I was like, OK, great. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> we'll see you Monday. It was oh one God. of those type of things. It, it really it came together so quickly. And I remember coming home and talking to my then girlfriend, now wife and saying, all right, I'm going to do this. And she was saying, well, what does the company do? And I said, I don't really know. <laughs> but I know they're in real estate. And they just brought on Leonard Steinberg. Yeah. And they have these amazingly talented people. And it's it's all going to be great. And I honestly was a little unsure myself. But I remember feeling two things. One, I remember feeling the early onset of potential business FOMO. Mm. And so I, I think business FOMO is the worst FOMO. Because you could miss a party or a vacation or an event. There's always going to be another one. Yeah. But – when it's professional in nature, whether it's when it's a business opportunity and you look back on it and you had an opportunity to be a part of it and you weren't, it really does stick with you and and you can't recreate that. And I just had a feeling that we were going to be reading about this company and in particular Robert. I, I knew that he was going to change the world in some way. Yeah. And I knew this company was going to do something. And I I sort of foreshadowed almost reading the articles online about their success and how I would have felt not being a part of that. And that's really what gave me the confidence to walk away from what was a great opportunity and then step into this company that was basically brand new. Yeah. And and at the time, I sort of swore to myself that the next thing I'm going to do is start my own company. I'm not going to go do this again because – it's hard and you're 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 working and you're building towards this eventual upside and most companies most startups don't even make it right and 90 so, something percent right yeah so it's probably in the high 90s yeah and so I, I took a leap of faith and that was eight and a half years ago you've had so many different positions at compass and <laughs> you just got a new position what two months ago yeah about two months ago yeah so walk us through where you started and where you are now with all of the different positions that we, you've taken we might need a second podcast to cover <laughs> all of it because it's a lot when i first came in my original mandate and again this is early days i think we had 30 employees in the whole company i mean it was really small so everyone kind of did a little bit of everything yeah the initial mandate was to help expand Compass by how do we bring in more agents and how do we launch in other markets. At that point, we hadn't even launched outside of New York. 
We were just in New York. Yeah. And so we had the the launch of DC on deck. So I helped with that, but that one had already been started. And then I started really from scratch launching some of the other markets. So I launched the Hamptons. I launched California. I remember with the Hamptons, you know, it was so funny. We were sitting around and we were our agents were saying, here are the markets we're getting referrals from. Because that's how we base where we should expand to. Yeah. And obviously New York City and Brooklyn, agents are saying, you know, we need a Hamptons presence. Mm-hmm. So we're in a meeting and someone's like, Does anyone know anything about the Hamptons? It's like, I'm from Long Island and I grew up going there as a kid. Yeah. I, I know it. It's like, okay. And I remember Robert being like, Great, go out there and and launch it. Wow. And I go out there, I spend the day, I come back, I'm in the office. That was a Monday. On Tuesday, I see Robert. He goes, What are you, what are you doing here? I'm like, Oh, I'm, I'm here. I'm working. He goes, No, you're supposed to be in the Hamptons. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh, no, I, I'm, we're launching it. I'm, I'm going to go here. He's like, No, 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 no. You got to go there. And it's actually early on where I really learned what it means to really take something to the next level. Mm. You could do something, but are you really going to do it? Yeah. The way he envisioned launching a market was you move there. You go there for months. You immerse yourself in it. Wow. You meet the agents. You open the office. You set everything up. You hire the staff. And if you do that and you really put that effort out up front, you're going to have a way more successful outcome. Mm. And so for my first year and a half, I was traveling the country doing that and helping to build out the team that recruits agents. And then I became Robert's chief of staff, which was, you know, was and is – the greatest professional experience I think I've ever had and something that uh, you'd almost wish that anyone could have that kind of experience to be chief of staff to this amazing leader as the company is in really hyper mode and scaling so quickly mm. and expanding and True. right in, in that hyper growth phase. And yeah. so I, I did that. And then after that, I started to take on regional management of our operations. So I ran our New York business, then that turned into the tri-state. Then I ran our East Coast business. Then I ran our West Coast business. Yeah. So, and then at one point I was doing the Northeast, California, and Hawaii. Oh my gosh. This was in all these different time zones. And then since then, now I'm overseeing growth. Yep. So that's all growth for the business, communications, yeah. and our coaching business as well, which is our coaching marketplace business. Right. And then I still oversee the Northeast business because I can't give it up. I have a special special place in my yeah, heart for- good. We for, want you. Yeah. <laughs> we want so, you to be here. So yeah, so I've had, I've had every job you can imagine and I've loved every one of them. And has there been a common thread through every single one of your positions? Has it always been communication or building or what? What has the common thread been? So I think, in, I think it's been two phases. I think in the early days of Compass, it was all building. It was it, There were roles that required someone who could move quickly, who could interpret and make sense of the, the confusion. Right, Companies are effectively confusion-generating machines. Mm-hmm. And so what happens is the people that can make sense of the confusion and create clarity, not only for themselves but for their teams, are the ones that are the most successful. So you can say, hey, we want to launch in California. But that's a confusing thing when people hear that because that means a different thing to everybody. Yeah. And so actually getting on the ground and putting together the structure and the process to actually go do that. And I enjoyed the entrepreneurial nature of that. That was the first, I'd say, couple of years. The, the theme was a lot more of that sort of stuff. I'd say the last couple of years has been managing and overseeing big teams of people, which I really enjoy because for me – where I get the most fulfillment is watching a big team of people get aligned around a common goal mm. and go out and go get the result and do it together. It's so enjoyable because it's so hard. It is hard. Individual contribution is hard. But what's really hard, at least in my view, is how do you get a number of individual contributors to come together? Yeah. And so much of that is about leadership and shared values and purpose and understanding and I'm someone who is I, – I really follow leadership. I enjoy leaders. I enjoy learning about how certain leaders, whether it's athletes or business people, whomever. And so I love to take kind of the things that I see there and apply them. And so that's really been the, the theme of the, the last few years. But Compass, I would say, the undercurrent of Compass is you need to be able to communicate and sell. Yeah. It doesn't matter true. what role you're in because we serve – Agents and agents are communicators. They are advisors. They engage with people. That's what they do. (laughs) Therapists. I I don't often use the word salespeople for agents as much because I actually see it a little differently. You're not 
you're not selling a product. Yeah. You're actually advising and bringing people together. People use sales as a shorthand description for ultimately what is the ability to be an empathetic communicator, to be able to tell a story. Agents are incredible storytellers. Yeah. And so there is a part of me that that's been an undercurrent for me. And I love that part of my job, hence communications, mm -hmm. hence growth. Yeah. But I, I think that's a theme. If you look at Compass across you know, many of our incredibly successful and talented employees in particular, you're going to see that everyone can communicate and can sell yeah. in, in their own way. Yeah. I, I think that's true. And I think you're right that we're not really salespeople. People have said, what would you do if you weren't, you weren't selling real estate? I'm like, well, it wouldn't be selling like widgets. Yeah. Like I wouldn't be selling stuff because I don't like to sell anything. I like to advise and support. Yes. And that's that's it. Advise, support, bring expertise, add value, and that's it. When I'm meeting with potential agents who are thinking about coming to Compass, I never feel like I'm selling the company yeah. because I believe in it. If you believe in something, you don't feel like you're selling it. Yeah. If you're working with a seller and you have a listing and you love the property, you, you walk into the home and you get excited by mm -hmm. it and you think it's an amazing home or you think there's tremendous value in the property or there's an opportunity to reposition it for the next person who purchases it, whatever that is, the way in which you're going to communicate about it, the passion and interest you have is going to naturally come through. 100%. So you might actually be selling the heck out of it, yeah. but you don't feel that way. Right. And that's how I feel with Compass. Yeah. It's not. It's less selling. It's more just telling a story of here's this amazing company that all these great agents and employees came together to build and have created this unique platform that just doesn't exist in our business. Yeah. And so it makes it easier <laughs> when the company has all that to back it up. That's true. So who inspires you? <laughs> That's a big question. I mean, I get inspiration from everywhere. I would say the obvious answer is my daughter. Mm -hmm. it, when when she comes up in the morning, I'm not really a morning person. Okay. So she's, uh, she's up way, way before me. I'm, yeah. I'm more of a night owl. Uh, when she like runs in the room and says, Daddy, wake up. Daddy, take a shower. Time to go to work, which is kind of her, her new thing. <laughs> I, I get significant amount of inspiration from that. Uh, seeing her smile, seeing the energy she just has around life, that inspires yeah. me. My, my family inspires me. My friends inspire me. Obviously, my colleagues and coworkers. I'm massively inspired by everyone at Compass. I'd say on the employee side, I'm just inspired by the shared sense of purpose and dedication. The amount of energy and effort that the employees at Compass put into the day-to-day, -day, it can't help but inspire you to want to work hard yeah. and, and do great things. When you look to your left and right and you see people who are doing incredible things and are giving their all and making a lot of sacrifices, it pushes you to want to be better. Yeah. And it's the same thing with our agents. When I see what our agents do on a day-to-day -day basis, and not just the natural order of being an agent, which is hard, right? Dealing with rejection, dealing with putting months and months, years sometimes into transactions and relationships and things falling apart at the last minute, but also seeing the other side of it, which are agents who come to the company, grow their businesses, do amazing things, launch businesses, create podcasts. and <laughs> the, the things that our agents do, they push me to say, well, if they're doing this, I need to be able to, to step it up. Yeah. And, and I also find, honestly, inspiration from, you know, People that I've never met or know personally, but have done things that inspire me. I'm a big Kobe Bryant fan. Me I too. I'm a diehard, diehard Kobe awesome. fan. I've you know watched the documentary about him a million times. I've read his book. I follow all these handles on Instagram and Twitter that yep. just highlight Kobe. It's not even just basketball. It's Kobe motivational totally. posts. Totally. And me it's too. just his – the way he approached his day-to-day, -day, his craft – his attention to detail, his obsessiveness around his work ethic. Yeah. That that inspires me. And it's sort of funny because you're reading this and you're like, I've never met this person. I don't know them. But you you see what they did and it sort of ignites a fire in you where you say, I want to do that. He's super inspiring and I follow his motivational quotes yeah, too. It's I like, mean, it's amazing what he's – and his work ethic and everything. Yeah. I, I, I found out actually that – one of our offices in Southern California, when he retired, he started a venture capital fund. And the fund was in the same office as I believe our office in Newport Beach. I'm, I'm oh, not sure. And I found that out, obviously, after, after he died. And I was so upset because had I known that, I would have gone there 
and just waited at the front at the entrance just to get five minutes with him, just to ask him a couple of business questions and, and how he what his approach was. But yeah, that's that's where I generate inspiration from. So before we get to my fearless five, which okay. is actually six. Yeah, you told me we're gonna do six. We're okay. gonna do six. I'm ready. Just because I love you, Rory. <laughs> I'm giving you six questions. What is something that most people value that you don't necessarily subscribe to? Ba- some- <laughs> balance. <laughs> Work life balance. <laughs> That's one thing. I don't. I don't believe in it. Yeah. I believe that if you love something and you're passionate, you you can't be balanced. You can't have it all. Yeah. You have to make decisions and sacrifices. Mm. And so the pursuit of balance, I think, is amazing. And I I pursue it too. I look to find it, but I'm just I'm just not capable of it. I am the things I'm passionate about, I want to do them all the time. Yeah. Every day, all the time. And so if I could I would hang out with my daughter, play guitar, work at Compass. I would do that. That's all I would do. I, I don't I don't see the need for balance because as long as you are deriving energy and enthusiasm, then that's the most important thing. So I've never really believed in that. I believe in wellness. I'm obsessive over wellness. I've gotten to the crazy, the most crazy wellness tick over the last number of months. <laughs> so I'm all in on that. But I don't believe I think balance is a myth. I grew up in more of an old school household. You know, my mom, if she were still alive today, the the second that vaccines were available, she would have said, "Oh, you're back in the office. You're you're not working from home." Right. That's that's not that's not real life. Right. <laughs> that's make believe. Yeah. So I, I think there's this sort of misalignment almost where a lot of people who are just kind of getting into the workforce are sort of asking, "Well, what are companies and what are people going to do for me? Not what are you going to do for yourself?" You look at my stepfather, you know, his first job was running cell tickets back and forth between buildings down on Wall Street wow. in 1968. My dad worked at a gas station, then sold dictaphones. I don't, they don't even make those anymore. Door to door. Like there, I do think there is something to be said of you have to pay your dues. You have to go through yeah. adversity. You have to experience those things because then when you do get to the place where your career starts to develop and build, you have a deeper appreciation. 1,000%. And you have an appreciation for the people who work with you, who work for you. And so, yeah, those are those are maybe a, a couple of the things. I agree with you. I don't think that anything worth having comes easy. And I believe in working your butt off. I was never handed a silver. I never, I didn't have a silver spoon. I don't have a dad who's a developer that gives me all my business. No. no. I work for every penny that I make. And, you know, I agree with you. I appreciate things so much more because of that. I was fortunate to grow up in a beautiful community. I went to a great high school. You know, my my father and stepfather worked really hard, did well. But I was – my parents, my father, my stepfather, and my mother – Grew up with nothing. Yeah. And so, and and they never forgot that. Yeah. And so even though me and my siblings were afforded way more opportunities than they ever were, yeah. they made sure to remind us of that. And I think about that now and I th- and they were right. And it's the sort of thing when you're a kid, your parents say, you'll thank me when you're older. Yeah. And you're like, I don't even know what that means. Yeah. <laughs> but one thing on this point of something that, that people believe in that I don't, the the concept that you can work remotely. Yeah. I I think it is it's not possible. It the two things don't actually make sense, work and remote. Working is about being with people, being around like-minded people where you're sharing ideas, concepts, that those natural interactions. You know, Robert always says it's about connectivity, not productivity, and I just don't believe that you can build a long-term sustainable career Remotely, unless, of course, your profession is one that what I like to say is if it was a remote profession before COVID, then fine. Yeah. But if it before COVID was not remote, it's never going to work. I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you, blessed with all the good fortune that I was, if I were working at home in my pajamas every day on Zoom. I agree. I mean, I was working from home before the pandemic just because while I love my team, and they can text me and call me anytime they want. I get more done when I'm not being well, it's asked a natural. million questions. But I'm out running around doing stuff all day long. It's natural because we know before COVID as agents, you're not at your desk in the office from no. 9 to 5 all the time. You're out and about. You're running to and from showings. You're going to appointments. You're meeting clients. You're stopping at home halfway through. Yep. So again, that was the natural 
course of how you worked before COVID. Yeah. But this idea that we're never going to set foot in an office with other people. Yeah, and I don't like look, that. I don't like commuting either. I'm lucky. I'm in New York City, so my commute's very manageable. But yeah. I understand that. But there is so much more value to being in person, and so and you get so much more happiness than being at home and being isolated. So I agree. I just redecorated my whole office. Has anybody gone in? <laughs> I bought art, leather desk accessories, so, marble lamps. Get back in the office. <laughs> okay, so it's time for my fearless five, or I don't know what we would call it this time. But it's six. Okay. What do you think humanity's most redeeming quality is? I know this is a tough one. You get two passes if you don't want to answer them, but you have to answer at least four. Okay. The capacity for love. Hmm. So if you think about love is the ultimate, it's the ultimate feeling and energy that no one can really describe, but you can only feel. Yeah. That's at the basis of all good things. Yeah. When you think about the opposite, hate is at the basis of all terrible things. Yeah. And ultimately, whenever we're, we're so, I think, so preoccupied with all the terrible things going on in the world, and there are a lot of bad things happening, but at the core of all the good things that are happening, it's yeah. a sense of love. Mm. And, and not necessarily love for each other, but yeah. love for someone yeah. that motivates you to want to make a good decision. Yeah. So whether that's love for your spouse and your partner or your children or your family or an organization that you care about and you're going to fight for. Yeah. That that sense of love, I think, it sounds a little cheesy, but we'd all be better off if we focus a little more on loving one another than yeah, I agree. You know, why, we're, why we're different. I love that answer. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. What coworker have you learned the most from? I think you might have already kind of yeah, answered I, this. Th this is this is a pretty easy one. It, it'd be yeah. it'd be Robert Refkin. Yeah. It's uh, it's it's kind of hard to not, given the the environment I've been in and the opportunity to work with him. But he he truly is a remarkable human being. There are just some people that are, are unique and special, and if you get to be around them and be in their orbit, it's it's such a gift. And and he is. He's absolutely that person. And, and the most remarkable thing about Robert is I've known him for now eight and a half years. He is the same person he was the, the day I met him. The same level of energy, excitement, maybe even more energy and passion and excitement. And and so, yeah, it, it's got to be him. There, there, there are a couple uh, couple follow-ups below him, but he's, he's definitely the first. What song changed your life? <laughs> well, given what we talked yeah. about earlier, Dazed and Confused yeah. by Led Zeppelin. Yeah. I'd have to say that that probably yeah because that made me want to play guitar. Yeah, that so intro, there you go. it was so ominous sounding. It was almost scary. Mm -hmm. I was almost listening to it, being like, "I'm kind of afraid of what I'm hearing," but it, this is really cool. How are they? So yeah, pro probably that. Confused, confused. That's yeah. awesome. I love that song. What do you wish you learned sooner? People management. Okay. Nobody teaches it. Right. No one. You never Tough. get taught how to be a people manager. Tough. You just. You, it, it's, it's sort of accidental. You go to work, and if you excel as an individual contributor, someone comes up to you and says, hey, congratulations, you got promoted, you should run a team. But no one ever actually sits down and teaches you what that means. Yeah. No one actually ever coaches you on how that works. And so you just have to learn it. If it weren't my, I was very lucky, my stepfather is probably the best people manager I've ever met. And so I was really lucky that growing up, a lot of the life lessons that I learned from him I didn't realize at the time where a lot of them were about people management and leading teams and how to scale things like empathy and, yeah. and shared understanding. And I work with an amazing executive coach named Doug Pardo, who has been an, a tremendous resource in terms of how to grow as a people manager. Mm. And so for me, I wish I could have learned that in a professional setting way earlier. It's hard though. And there's so much trial and error. So much trial and error. But, but think about it. You get you usually get taught how to do other things. Exactly. In college you get taught you get taught what a PL is. You people explain I, didn't. <laughs> I went to an acting conservatory program. All right, so a little different. <laughs> but but you 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 take accounting, you take corporate finance, you take marketing. And again, in an educational setting it's different. But even in the professional space, you are actively taught how to do your job. But no one really sits down and says let me help work with you on how to be a great people leader because yeah. it is a skill. And if you can work at it and develop it, you know, it, it can do amazing things. And I will say you have that skill. You are really good at what you do. Thank you. You Thank are. You. Yeah. What is the strangest thing you've encountered walking down the street in New York City or on the subway? Oh, my God. I mean, the strangest? The strangest or weirdest or 
most mind boggling or most recent strangest. Yeah, I, I'll probably I'll probably pass on that one because okay. it would involve something things that are but, you're talking about New York City subway, things are gonna be inappropriate for a podcast. Yeah. So you you I mean you live in New York. You already know what the answer oh, to that is. Whatever I, you've whatever you've seen most recently, <laughs> it's the same thing I've yeah, seen. Yeah. It's not yeah, it's not I mean I like to think whenever I see things in New York City on the street that really are either mind boggling or even scary. I try Try to look for the positive. It's yeah. character forming. It's like it okay, is character forming. That, that doesn't phase me. I, I think I'm good. I'll be all right, no matter what happens. Puts hair on the chest. <laughs> exactly. So number six. I know you said you don't sing, but if you had to, <laughs> what would be your go-to karaoke song? Either New York, New York, Frank Sinatra, mm. or Purple Rain, Prince. So those are two songs I sing my to my daughter at night. Oh. I, I'm, I'm over all the nursery rhymes and now she says, Daddy, sing one of your songs. So, so far we have done and she's mastered Sweet Child of Mine. Amazing. Which is, that's sort of her song. That that Archer song that. is Sweet Child of Mine. She has a big neon sign in her room that says Sweet Child of Mine. Oh, I love that. You know, obviously Guns N' Roses, yeah. my favorite band, Slash, all that. So we do that. We do Purple Rain. We do New York, New York. We do Hypnotize by Biggie because mm-hmm. I'm a I'm a huge huge Biggie fan Biggie. and, and hip hop fan. Yeah, I mean if you're from New York, you know love Biggie. Yeah, I mean, you got problems. And now we're working on Under the Bridge by the Red Hot Chili Peppers. So, awesome. Yeah, yeah. So prob- probably probably oh yeah probably New York New York or Purple Rain. They're easy. I can't sing, so I need ones that can you can kind of just belt out. Yeah. And even if you sing loudly and not well, it kind of works. Those well, two. I feel like most people who sing karaoke do it loudly and not well. <laughs> and not well, yeah. You and never see the good singers. Yeah, I never see the good singers for whatever reason don't go to karaoke. If I was a good singer, I'd go to karaoke all the time. Yeah, just, they go yeah. to like this the special karaoke Spe- bars yeah. where you have yeah, private yeah, yeah, yeah. rooms. You're right. Yeah, and not, they practice. Yeah, not, the, not like the silly birthday party ones that, right. we, that we do. Exactly. So. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. We're going to let the audience hear a little snippet of you playing the guitar because you are so good. chat with you i i'm really you know getting to know you better is just so i'm so grateful for that and i'm grateful you. for your time no thank you so much for having me this yeah. is awesome thank you for watching and listening to kelly minds her manners make sure to subscribe to the show and don't forget to leave us a review to tell us what you liked about the episode you can connect with kelly at kelly minds her manners on instagram and tiktok or on our website www.kellymindshermanners.com 